rejoicing of thanking God for sending Jesus and the wonderful gift for God's unspeakable gift, Paul says. And certainly we cannot describe the immensity of that gift from God of his son to us. God gave his son. His son gives gifts to the church and the Holy Spirit also gives gifts to individuals. And uh, we at Christmas time are remembering that we give gifts to each other. Now, what I want to do this morning is bring two things together. Uh, but before I do, I want to read from Psalm 95. Psalm 95. My wife and I usually give uh, some sweets and lollies to children just the Sunday before Christmas, but because she's not so well this morning, not able to be here, I will reserve that till the day right after Christmas, Boxing Day. So uh, that will get all the boys and girls here, won't it? Won't it? And uh, that will be next Sunday. All right, Psalm 95, please. Oh, come, let us sing. That's what we've been doing. Unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise. Even Frank was making a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Well done, Frank. Came over good. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Little g there. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. And to whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my Sabbath, my rest. Taking an unusual topic this morning. It's an unusual title. I don't know if you'll find the message unusual. I hope you will in some ways. It's entitled The Significance of the Sabbath Rest of God in the Light of Christmas. There have been two issues on my mind as I've approached this message and this uh, week. First of all, the Christmas message. It's a unique time of the year. It's only once in the year, so we can rightly use that word unique in respect of it. It's the time when we celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus, the incarnation. Whether the timing is right or not is really insignificant and inappropriate even to discuss. It really is not relevant. The fact is that at this time of the year, we do recognize in a special way the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings us to issues such as Bible prophecy. For example, Micah 5.2, where the prophet said some six, seven hundred years before Christ, where Jesus was going to be born. He says, And thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands in Judah. In other words, you are an insignificant town. And certainly it is. Only about uh, two miles or so, I think, if I remember rightly, from my visits to uh, Israel. I only made one visit there, actually. And I went to Bethlehem, and as if I recall correctly, it's quite close to the major city, Jerusalem. But the prophet says it's not going to be in Jerusalem, but it's going to be in the insignificant town of Bethlehem. And thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet from you shall he come forth unto me, whose goings forth have been from of old, from the days of eternity. And so there we have so much portrayed the pre-incarnation of Christ, the fact that he existed before he was born in Bethlehem, the fact that he would be born in Bethlehem. It was the 
text that the uh, uh, Jewish scholars uh, referred to when the wise men came from the east and said, tell us where the little child is going to be born. And they said in Bethlehem. Strange, wasn't it, that those wise men, we don't know how many there were, followed the star and yet they seemed to stop and ask the king. I wonder why. Maybe if they kept their eyes on the star all the way, they wouldn't have caused so much concern and trouble. But they went to uh, Herod's palace thinking that this very prominent child would be born in a palace and Herod was very troubled. First of all, to think that there was going to be somebody who was going to compete with him as the king of the Jews. And uh, secondly, because of the uh, nature of their inquiry. And so he called for some scholars and they came up with Micah 5.2. The other passage of scripture has been very much going through my mind, which is the one that always comes to us, I'm sure. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Notice the Hebrew parallelism there. The, uh, a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Miracle. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the extent of his government there shall be no end. Marvelous, marvelous message. And of course, it would be inappropriate for me not to refer to Christmas in this Sunday just before Christmas. But then also I've been thinking about the sequence of studies that we've been taking. Hebrews, and I felt that the Lord had placed that upon my heart. Some people don't like series, but I think it's good. Uh, it's a good discipline for the preacher. <laughs> and uh, it's a good discipline for the congregation to follow a sequence of thoughts and messages and we've we've got up to Hebrews chapter 4. I received a note from Mark Mullins who has written an article for our next magazine which we're hoping to get out in the first week now of uh, January. We thank you for your prayers. Well Mark is writing an article for us in the next CTF which is coming out shortly and he made a point that uh, he didn't have a message until really at the last minute. And I'm very often like that. Um, I do think and meditate and study during the week, but it never really comes together until uh, the last minute. And, uh, and he said it's very important to have it as a word from the Lord. And that is why it is important for us to be in the house of God as much as we are able, because there may be a particular message, not only for the whole congregation and you're supporting that congregation, but also for you particularly. Um, and uh, so I appreciated that. And uh, Mark's cousin, Philip, wrote a similar article on the majestic word. And he said how important it is that when we preach, we preach as the oracles of God, not the messages of men, but the oracles of God. So when I decided to go through Hebrews, it was not in the sense that it had to be Sunday after Sunday. And as you know, we've had a break and occasionally we've changed. And last one Sunday we changed. And uh, Brother Iron Morgan brought us an excellent message last Sunday morning and he will be with us next Sunday morning. But I do believe that if God impresses something on you, then it's good to continue with that. Um, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who uh, I look on as a bit of a mentor, having known him and sat and listened to him, people call him a, a mentor who've never known him really, but uh, he was a, a great preacher of the gospel. And uh, rather unique in that, uh, that's, you can't have rather unique things, can you? Either it's unique or it's not unique. But uh, he, he was... Um, well, he, he was one, of a, one, of a, one, one on his own in a way um, because he had, had the ear almost, not of the nation, I wouldn't say that, I, I, I don't think any recent preachers had the ear of the nation. You have to go back to people like uh, John Knox and um, John Wesley and um, those who really had the ear of the nation and turned the nation. 
But certainly Martin Lloyd-Jones had the voice of the populace. And um, he is different from many popular preachers of today in that not only did he have the ear of the populace, but he had the knowledge of God. There are some who have the ear of the populace. They are popular preachers and they can gather crowds, but they do not have the message of the Lord. In fact, in many instances, they pervert the message of the Lord. But this was not so of Martin Lloyd-Jones. So he had the ear of the populace, but he also knew the message of the Lord. And he used to advise his preachers. He would say, you know, preach in series by all means, but be prepared to break from it. So that if something comes up of a special note or a special significance, don't just keep uh, just arduously to that series, but be alert to hearing the voice of God for a particular time. And I think that is very, very important. And so what I'm doing, trying to do today, is to bring two things together. The Christmas message is really the start of the fulfillment of the keeping of the rest that Paul refers to, or if Paul wrote Hebrews, the writer of the Hebrews refers to in Hebrews chapter 4. So let's read Hebrews chapter 4. It alludes back to the verses 17, 18, and 19 of chapter 3. But who, with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Let us therefore fear. I thought fear was the opposite of faith. Well, no, it's not always. There is a holy fear. There is a wholesome fear. Let us fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel, means good news, preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place, of the seventh day on this wise and God did rest the seventh day from all his works and in this place again if they shall enter into my rest seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief again he limited a certain day saying in David Psalm 95 which we've read. Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. For if Jesus should be Joshua, that's the term Joshua and Jesus interchangeable, and here there's a reference to Joshua taking the children of Israel into the promised land. For if Joshua had given them the true rest, then would he not afterward then would he, that is God now, not afterward, because God used Joshua and God used David, and so it's always God who is doing it, then would he, God, not afterwards, have spoken of another day, a day of rest. There remains, therefore, the keeping of a Sabbath. That word rest in that verse is different from the use of the word 
in the Greek language in the other verses where the word rest appears, although it has the same similar connotation. But here it is a direct reference to keeping the Sabbath. Therefore, there remains the keeping of the Sabbath to the people of God. Now, the Sabbatarians, the Seventh-day Adventists say, there you are. Uh, that means that you have to keep the Sabbath day. But what they do, and they're making the mistake, is they're seeing the, that which symbolizes the true Sabbath as being the necessary thing for the present. The children of Israel kept the Sabbath day, but they didn't enter into God's rest. The children of Israel went into the land of promise, but they didn't enter into God's rest because of unbelief. So it's not now referring to that which symbolizes the rest, but to the rest itself. There remains, therefore, the keeping of a Sabbath to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, that is God's rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let me just allude back to Christmas for a moment. Albert Barnes, who is a very, very fine Bible expositor, in his notes on the Bible about Isaiah 9 says this. We have quoted Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This chapter, Isaiah 9, is a continuation of the prophecy begun in Isaiah 7 and continued in Isaiah 8. It is composed of mingled threats and promises. Its characteristic may be said to be rays of light thrown into the midst of shades. It promises comfort and deliverance, while at the same time it denounces the sins of the nation and assures the nation that the anger of the Lord is not turned away. The previous chapter had closed by describing a time of great general calamity and darkness. This then begins in Isaiah 9, 1 to 4, by showing that the calamity would not be so great as in the former times. It would be mitigated. There would be light, particularly in the dark regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, the provinces lying most exposed to the Syrian invasion. This light or deliverance was connected to the birth of a promised child, Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, unto us a child is born, as we have quoted. And the mention of this leads the prophet into a magnificent description of his names, character, and reign. The prophet then returns to the threatened destruction of Israel and denounces the divine judgment against it. By the Syrians and the Philistines, it would be invaded and destroyed. Isaiah 9, 8 to 12. The effects of this in cutting off their sources of strength and producing... General dismay and ruin are described in the remainder of the chapter, Isaiah 9, 13 to 21. The chapter, therefore, would impart consolation to the inhabitants of Judah and is, designate, is designed to confirm the promise that it should be safe from the threatened invasion. But, you know, whereas I can appreciate what he's saying and certainly agree with it to a large extent, the word of God is bigger than that. And the position of the message and messenger more significant than that. For example, in 2 Peter 1.21 we read, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. They're not just writing natural events. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And the terminology there is as they were carried along by the Holy Ghost. And that is the dimension, brothers and sisters, that we increasingly need in our preaching from our pulpits, being carried along by the Holy Ghost, so that this nation and the nations of the world may again give heed to the message of the Lord, as they did in John Wesley's time, as they did in Jonathan Edwards' time. So, 
as they did in C.H. Spurgeon's time, so they can do in our time as we are moved by the Holy Ghost. God's purpose and program are, have two chief features. The first is the glory of the Creator. That is supreme and sublime above all other things. That he may have the glory, the glory of the Creator. The other is the good of the creature. These two things must be retained and maintained in order and in balance. They dare not be reversed. Great heresy results from getting the two mixed. God's glory, man's good. If you reverse it and say man's glory, you've destroyed everything. And this is where the problem in the modern church arises. Because in most instances, it is the eulogy of men and not the glory of God which is being presented. It's the eulogy of the presentators, the people who present themselves, who sing their songs, who make their jigs and dances on the platform. Look at me, how good I am, and who smile brilliantly, and we like to see smiles, no problem with that. But the whole thing is focused on the presenters, and that is not for the glory of God, and ultimately, it will not be for the good of man. It cannot be. Those two things have to be kept in perspective. In this connection, I have come to see the meeting point of Christmas and the Sabbath rest of God. The Sabbath was the final act of God in his seven-day creation program and is the pivot on which the two tables of commandments rest. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Genesis reads, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now, you know, those who try to make the, the ages, the days of Genesis chapters 1 to 3, geological ages, immediately run into a problem. If they are geological ages, then you have God resting for a geological age. And if you have God resting for a geological age, you have no age, and you have no world, and you have no universe. So it, it's, a, it's a major problem to try and rationalize the record. Far better to just accept it on face value. That the day, the morning and evening were the first day. The morning and the evening were the second day. And isn't it interesting, from the third day right through to the fifth day, after all of the created order, starting with the earth and, and the peopling of it, God pronounces good every day. From the third day, not the first and second, but from the third day on, he says it was good. The first day was light, the dividing of darkness from light. God is light, and so I suppose when he created, there was light, but it seems to have, something's happened, darkness has come. Uh, I know that um, death comes through sin, um, but uh, who originated sin? Was it man, or was it Lucifer, who in the pride of his heart said, I'll be like God? And when did that happen? We don't know. But certainly we do know, all that we need to know, is that the death of the human race, and I think that term death, it personally, refers to all in Adam, uh, uh, came as a result of sin. And as by one man, sin entered into the world. So, and death by sin. So by one man, and that man, Christ Jesus, life has come upon all. That, that is how I understand it. So we have 
uh, day one, light, and, uh, uh, and then by the time you get to day three, you have the earth, and, and then the division of each of the, uh, uh, the water above and the water beneath, and so on. And um, uh, you have uh, the creatures, and on each day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, it says, it was good. God pronounced it good. That is good for man. Right? See, uh, the two things, keep them in balance. God's glory, man's goodness. Good. He, he, want, he, he wants to be good to us. Right? You know, some, some people are so miserable in their presentation of Christianity that, that they don't attract anybody. You know, whereas there's judgment, it's, it's not all judgment. I, I've written an editorial for this magazine that some people say that, uh, you know, hell is mentioned more times uh, than heaven. No, it's not. Do a test. Hell is only mentioned about 23 times. Our English word hell only appears 23 times, I think, in the New Testament. But the word heaven appears multiple times, hundreds of times mainly in that phrase, kingdom of heaven. But nevertheless, you see, and, and the, the gospel is good news. It's not bad news. It's good news. As, as uh, another Welshman said, um, it's not good views. It's good news. It's, it's not my view or your view. Um, you know, people say, what do you think? And I, I usually say, it's not a question of what I think. And it's not a question of what you think, but it's a question of what God says. And, and this is what we've, we've got to come back to increasingly. And so God said, it is good. It's for his glory, but it's for man's good. An ancient philosopher said, it's not possible to have something which is good in, in God and bad in man. But he's wrong. He's wrong in this instance. It is good for God to seek his glory. But it is bad for man to seek his own glory. Why? Because there is nothing greater than God's glory. And so if you seek your own glory or somebody else's glory, you are seeking something which is less than the best. But God, when he seeks his glory, he is seeking the best. But God, in seeking his glory, turns it back for my benefit, for our good. He wants to bless us. Take the great announcement in Nazareth when Jesus stood up and it was delivered to him, the prophet Isaiah. And he, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. What? Good tidings, good news. Go down through the list and it's all good things. And he stops short of the judgment because that is yet to be. And we must have our doctrine of judgment correct. And it was very well expressed for us through Pastor Morgan a few Sundays ago. We must have our, our doctrine of judgment correct. But presently, brothers and sisters, we are living in the age of grace when God wants to bless people. But he won't bless people through a faulty message or through a false aim or purpose. We must always keep there before us the glory of God, seeking the glory of God, not our own. And then he will bring it to pass. Blessed be his wonderful, wonderful name. After specifying that all that was done on those days, three, four, five, as good. On the sixth day, God makes a great summary of all, and he says it was all very good. <laughs> God does everything perfectly. Now, the other thought that I brought out was that uh, this Sabbath, uh, you see, and it's really at the Sabbath as God is in rest, that he, he looks back and pronounces it all very, very good. And he has entered into his rest. And he says, my intention is for you to enter into that rest. 
And Israel never did. Keeping the Sabbath doesn't put you in the day of rest. Going into the promised land didn't give them rest. Gave them great turmoil and conflict. Because all of that was symbolic. Symbolic of something which is yet to be. This seventh day rest of God Almighty is the hinge or the pivot of the two tables of the law. You know there are two. There's four commandments which relate to God. And there are six which follow which relate to man. The Roman Catholic Church introduces another one. Divides it. They often do that. Uh, you know, uh, they pervert the word of God. Uh, but the true word of God, there are four which relate to God and, and um, six which relate to man. The, the uh, fourth is the keeping of the Sabbath. Let me just read it to you. Remember the Sabbath day, Exodus 28 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. You shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, nor the cattle, nor your stranger that is in your gates. Why? Because in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. I thought what Colin shared with us a couple of Sunday nights ago when he said, why did it take God so long to create the world? Why did it take seven days? Why not seven seconds? He could speak the whole thing into existence. Uh, and, and he said it was for this very reason that he might teach us the truth of the Sabbath day. For on the Sabbath day, he rested. And then he instituted that for a period to Israel as a symbolic Thing. So of each of the acts of God on the third to the fifth days of creation, it is written, God saw that it was good. On the sixth day, as a summary statement, God says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So he rested on the seventh day and proclaimed it a Sabbath rest. And this takes us right to Hebrews chapter 4, where the Sabbath is shown to have four great representative truths. First of all, it implies an everlasting gospel. Verse 2 of Hebrews 4. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. One of the errors that the uh, modern church uh, um, has uh, adopted, I think, is uh, the idea that the church uh, started on the day of Pentecost. I don't think it did. Um, in fact, I, uh, I've always maintained that the church, if you're going to take a starting point in New Testament terms, you have to go to the day of the resurrection, not the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is the empowering of the church, a very wonderful and important experience. But the day of the resurrection is the commencement of the church. And on that day, Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive Holy Spirit. We are born again on the basis of the resurrection of Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit on the basis of his resurrection. Um, and of course, um, Pentecostals and Charismatics have tried to claim a, um, you, you know, a possession of the Holy Spirit because of our teaching on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they have made a sad error. There are many, many of God's people who are in the kingdom of God who do not accept our doctrine on that point. Uh, and even though I, I think they're wrong on that point, nevertheless, they have the Spirit and they do know the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul makes it very, very clear, if any man does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. So what makes us his is having the Holy Spirit within us. And that comes on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even predating that, uh, there were those in the Old Testament who I believe uh, enjoyed the same experience that we enjoy of salvation in and through Jesus Christ. They jumped across the ages. 
Jesus said of Abraham, he saw my day and he rejoiced to see it. How did he do it? He did it by faith, just like we do it by faith. But his faith was greater than our faith because we look back on an event, which is an historic event. He had to grasp it by faith, looking forward into the future. And Jesus said, he saw my day and he rejoiced to see it. That's why we are told that when we come into the kingdom of God, we are children of Abraham. Because the same faith that motivated him motivates us. Us. People like David, the psalmist, how could he describe the crucifixion in such detail as you have in Psalm 22 if he did not embrace the truth of the gospel? So you have the gospel in the time before Jesus came and you have the church established already. It's an everlasting gospel that is implied. The gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us. In Revelation 14, 6, we read, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now what this implies, I suppose, depends on the way you interpret the book of the Revelation. But I believe that it has an implication here that there is an unchanging message and it has been proclaimed by men throughout the ages and now the angel will take up the same message and proclaim it. It's the same everlasting gospel. Some people try to divide it up and say, oh no, it's something that has special reference to the Jews or whatever. Well, look, I'm not going to argue about that or, or enter into a dispute about that. But I believe that there is one everlasting gospel, and that gospel is that salvation is offered to all men through our Lord Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile, every bond and free, prisoner and those who are free out of prison, they all come that way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And here it is implied that the Sabbath has that as its starting point. An everlasting gospel is implied. The angels announced when he was born, unto you is born this day in the city of David. <coughs> what? A savior who is Christ the Lord. And here is the beginning of the fulfillment of the significance of the Sabbath. You will not know anything about the Sabbath rest of God unless you embrace the truth of salvation through Jesus Christ. And then we find here in Hebrews chapter 4, not only that an everlasting gospel is implied, but you have an unavoidable requirement is made. Hebrews 3.19 says, you see, they could not enter in. Why? Because of unbelief. Faith is the unavoidable requirement. Chapter 4, verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with with faith. Verse 1, let us fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his arrest, any of you should seem to come short of it, and it is implied through lack of faith. Faith is the currency of heaven. You cannot get saved by any other means. You will not and cannot get saved by good works. If you are relying on what you have done or will do or can do or should do, you will fail miserably because all of your works are just like filthy rags before God. Give him a million dollars and you have not enriched him one little bit. Because he owns everything. Use your intellectual powers to think your way, as Richard Dawkins tries to do. And you are just a minion in comparison with the intelligence of the Almighty. 
fight with all your might for right against wrong, and it will not earn you one step on your road to heaven. It has to be faith. And in that we are all equal. And it shows how God is impartial. And God has allowed every one of us to enter on the same basis. The rich can come. The poor can come. The fools can come. The intelligentsia can come. All can come on that one basis. Believe what I've told you. Believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. Believe that he died to cleanse your sins away. And you will find salvation in him. An unavoidable requirement is made. And then you'll find that a universal need is met. I've got something here called making sense of Christmas. Can you make sense of Christmas? Christmas can be a confusing time for many people. Often we have high hopes for the Christmas holiday, but we find it very stressful. But God wants us to enter into his rest. How can you be stressed and at rest? There are so many pressures rushing to buy gifts and their, at their, and their high cost. The stress of meeting relatives or the opposite, feeling all alone. So sadly, Christmas is a time when problems come into our lives. Debt, worry, loneliness, even suicide. Somehow it seems that there is something wrong. There is such a big contrast between the way of the world spends Christmas and the religious message which is almost forgotten. How can we make sense of Christmas? And as we approach Christmas, my oh my, we all feel, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a rest? Wouldn't it be great to enter into the Sabbath? They couldn't enter in because of unbelief. But here in this wonderful promise that we're going to enter in, a universal need is met, rest. Look at it in verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 4. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. The rest is met. The promise of the Sabbath. And the one who was born in a manger, grew up in Nazareth, became a teacher in Galilee, came past a group of men and he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will what? Welcome you into my Sabbath. <laughs> I will give you rest. And yet, being realistic, and this is the irony of the whole thing. Just think of what happened as a result of Christ coming into the world. Wise men said, where, are, where is he? And a wicked king said, I'll kill him. And in order to kill him, he killed all the children under, all the boys under two years of age. Just think of that for a moment. Not just in Bethlehem, in my view, probably right through to Nazareth and all around the coast there. I think he probably would not have done anything in Jerusalem. Because the wise men had heard that it was going to be in Bethlehem. But he wanted to make sure and... He killed them all. And so this one who is coming to give rest, suddenly you have this trauma and this turmoil, the murder of children. And isn't that so of our gospel, the message we preach? We preach a message of peace. And yet, like the psalmist in the Old Testament said, well, I'm for peace, they are for war. And all you've got to do is speak peace through Jesus and in our own country, very soon, there will be war against us. Because we are discriminating against the Muslims or against some other religion. We are discriminating against them. They don't think that they are discriminating against us. It's a one-way street, isn't it? But that's the truth of it. 
preach Jesus Christ, the only way, the truth, and the life, and very soon you will be ostracized. You might even be exterminated. Take up a message against some of the awful things that are happening in, in, in our society today. And we alluded to it the other day where every society that has not simply practiced homosexuality but celebrated it is on the downward trend and ultimately destroys itself. And that's fast where we're at. It's not just a question. I've talked to people and they say, well, it's always happened. Yes, it's always happened. There's no doubt about that. But now we are celebrating it. As it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. A universal need is met in this statement. You will enter into my rest. But... And here is something that sometimes we don't grasp. A progressive picture is presented. Verses 6 to 8. It's not all immediate. When Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. They experienced a lot of restlessness. They didn't enter immediately into rest. They were persecuted. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome this world. And what is being presented here is a progressive rest. It's a progressive picture that is being presented. Verses 6 to 8 of Hebrews chapter 4. Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. They didn't enter in because of unbelief. It was offered to them. But again, long after Joshua, in the time of David, as we've read in Psalm 95, it says there, God says, today, after so long a time, today, if you will hear my voice, harden not your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, it's, it's progressive. It's a progressive thing that is being presented. And so it is with a rest in Christ. Our rest starts with salvation. Thank God it doesn't end with there. <laughs> although at the end of it will be salvation but there's much more along the way we Pentecostals do sincerely believe that there is something else which gives us rest in regard to our evangelistic work and that is the energizing and power of the Holy Spirit you will receive ability says Acts chapter 1 after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and there is nothing that causes us to enter into his rest more than a realization that it's not by our strength. You people who go out on the streets evangelizing, and I commend you and thank God that it's raised up. And it's been almost spasmodic, and not spasmodic, automatic, hasn't it? You, you folks have just done it, and, and, and you run with it, and it's, it's very wonderful. But I want to encourage you, dear friends, it's not by the ability of your words to convince others. It's not by your logic or your reasoning. It's not by your debating ability. It's not by the strength of your personality, but it's by the Holy Spirit. And that is why every one of us needs the mighty energy of the Holy Spirit. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, please note, I didn't say one thing about tongues. Why? Because so many people simply seek tongues and they end up with cold tongues instead of the energy and power and might of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters, and we need to wait upon him for him to come upon us with power from on high. Those early disciples didn't know what was going to happen to them. And I think it would be a jolly good thing if many people didn't know what's going to happen to them when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. But you can be assured, if it is the Holy Spirit, it will not be bizarre. It will not be out of control. It will be for the benefit and blessing of all, not for the ridicule of men. Salvation. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Crucified life, 
That's the ultimate thing. When Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you to be fishers of men, he set off for the cross. And he expected them to follow him all the way. Not to give up halfway. And Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The crucified life is the big ego crossed out. So it's no longer me that lives, but it's Christ living in me. This is really the heart of where things go wrong so much. Right out throughout history, it's not just in our day. There was a bishop who was born on December the 16th, 340 AD. His name was Eusebius. He was referred to in history as a bold bishop. I get communications from um, a Christian history group who select particular days when certain things have happened in history. And this last week was, of course, December 16. And um, uh, yeah, we've, we're at this, yeah, we are, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> and um, this, uh, this man was born on that day in 340. And this is part of what they say about it. No sooner had the church found freedom from outside persecution in the Roman Empire than it experienced division from within. In the world, you will have tribulation. Emperor Constantine made Christianity legal, where before a bishop had to be a lover of Christ, willing to die for truth under dreadful tortures. Now the post was coveted by many as a position of prestige. Sound familiar? Influence and easy money. Sound even more familiar? You need more money. Just to keep my pay at $300,000 a year. You know who I'm alluding to. That's a cool $6,000 a week. And that doesn't include other advantages like driving the top Holden Caprice and a top motorbike and other extras. Sound familiar? Side by side with the honorable church leaders, and this is something we've got to put into the mix. There are still honorable church leaders. You may have these out here who wrought the system to their own advantage. But there are many who have sacrificed and still sacrifice much. So side by side with honorable church leaders, heretics rose to power. The foremost of the early heresies was Arianism, a doctrine that for all practical purposes denied the divinity of Christ. It had many powerful backers. I could go on, but really all false doctrine is an attack upon Jesus Christ. All heresy, founders on that rock, preaching yourself instead of Christ, whatever, preaching your denominational doctrine, whatever. Keep him there. Hallelujah, the Christ of Christmas. So there's always been this mixture of, you know, yes, there's going to be a rest. There's going to be a rest. And here it is progressively offered, progressively offered. But, but thank God there's something else here. An ultimate goal is reached. So we have a, uh, an everlasting gospel implied have an unavoidable requirement made, faith, a universal need is met, rest, we all need it, a progressive picture is presented, and then an ultimate goal is reached. Verses 9 to 10, there remaineth therefore the keeping of a Sabbath unto the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, that is, entered into God's rest, he also has ceased from his own works. Christ has ceased from his works. He has entered into his rest. The babe that was born at Bethlehem. 
For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And what will come out of that? The government will be upon his shoulder. Hallelujah. And from the governmental right that he has, he dispenses the one thing that we all need. What is it? Rest. Do you feel you need rest? The older I get, the more I feel I need rest. And the more rest I get, the more I feel I need rest. But I'm not just talking about it in a physical sense, but rather in a spiritual sense here. And so what is embraced here in that wonderful analogy which started off with in symbolic form when on the seventh day God rested from all his works he was saying I am doing it for my glory but I am doing it for your good because you too will enter into my rest this last year and I guess we'll well we're gonna have one more Sunday but I probably won't say much next Sunday I might say a little bit. <laughs> we'll have Pastor Morgan. And that'll be good. But this last year, we, we've lost some dear friends. One notable. That is known as a result of our work and ministry, and or before, actually, uh, around the world. But came to know some dear friends as a result of CWM and the work that goes on from this place. And one brother from England, you know him, his name is Mark Mullins. He wrote when he heard, he said, during our church holiday during August, I had one particularly difficult day when, after walking in Dovedale in the Peak District and feeling pretty exhausted, I had to do a trip to London and back that evening, returning at about 2 a.m. I had a splitting headache and developed a fever I suspect through dehydration. This continued until the next morning when I telephoned our junior doctor who gave me the tea and sympathy I thought I needed. No actual tea, sadly. As I was lying in bed feeling sorry for myself, the words of the chorus, victory in Jesus, came into my mind. And I knew I had to get up. I then discovered I was taking the prayer meeting at 7 a.m. So that was the first song we sang. And it was a song <clears throat> that Bert Tunis taught them at Bawtree. I don't know whether Matthew can play it. And Frank can sing it. I see he's doing some frantic searching there. I heard an old, old story how a savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning, and then I repented of my sin and won the victory. O oh, victory in Jesus, my savior forever, he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me into victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. I heard about a mansion. He has built for me in glory. And here's the ultimate. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. How about it? We've heard about the incarnation. We've heard about Jesus. He came. He came to give us rest. He came for his glory, sure, but he came also for our good. We've entered into his rest in salvation, and progressively, we are going on. There may be those who say, yes, I, 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 I'm saved, but I need the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we sing this, just open your hearts to him.
Or those of you who are not absolutely certain about your destiny in heaven, make sure this morning so you will enter ultimately into that full rest.